Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Navigating the Intersection of Profit and Purpose, Women Leading the Way in Doing Good While Doing Well. We're so excited to have our esteemed guest, Marsha DeWood, today. Um, she's an Angel Capital Association board member and the author of Doing Good While Doing Well. Um, we had a last minute change of host, but as a long term fan of Marsha and the incredible work that she's doing for women in business, I'm very honored to be here today. My name is Victoria Franco. I'm the director of marketing at BCC Research. I lead an amazing team of about 15 people to increase brand awareness, ROI, and client experience for BCC. And our data and equity of roles is a huge part of our success in that. Um, I'm grateful to work for a company that treats everyone equally, but as someone who's been in this industry for a few years, I know it's not always the case, especially when it comes to women in business. With that being said, I'm very grateful to announce our incredible guest who is constantly improving the view of women in business and turn it over to Marsha um, to go a little bit more in depth about herself and her impressive career. Well, thanks so much, Victoria. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Um, so basically in 2012, I didn't even know what angel investing was. I really had never even seen an entrepreneur I didn't even know if I even knew what an entrepreneur, you know, what they were really doing. But I got invited to an angel investing meeting and I was just so fascinated at all of the things that entrepreneurs were doing. Um, and I was living in Pittsburgh at the time, so I didn't even realize how much innovation was happening in my own backyard in a place like Pittsburgh when I usually thought it happened in Silicon Valley or New York or some big city. So over the years, I started, you know, watching entrepreneurs, helping them, advising them um, from a business perspective, and then also investing. I moved to New York City in 2014 and realized how little funding went to women when I joined a group called Golden Seeds. They invest only in women-led companies. And I was just blown away at how little funding goes to female founders. It's less than 2% of VC funding. For angels, it's slightly better, but for the most part, um, women just don't get the amount of funding that they need in order to create the innovations that we want to see in the world for women, women's health, uh, products specifically for women, all of those things. So um, I just really wanted to be a part of that and try to try to help change that narrative. Women are 50% or, you know, roughly of the population. I can't believe that there's only 3% of good ideas out there are made by women-led companies. So uh, we really need to change that. We also need to change the narrative and that's something that we're gonna be talking about today and talking about that women-led companies actually do better. Uh, they have better revenues, they do more with less money. And that is the narrative we really need to change it to. So we don't want to keep talking about how little funding goes to women. We want to be talking about the successes and why everyone should be investing in women-led companies. So impressive. Uh, thank you so much, Marsha. And thank you again for joining us today. Um, so let's dive into it. I do want to just go over the agenda for today. So we had our introductions. We're going to go into women in business and what does that really mean? Then we're going to talk about making decisions um, and then, of course, doing good while doing well. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, throw those in the chat. Um, if you feel comfortable, send them out to everyone. If not, so, uh, send them just to me. Um, and I will make sure not to say your name when asking the question. Um, and then we'll just close out with a quick thank you and some freebies from BCC Research and Marsha DeWood. Great. Awesome. Um, so, Marsha, you clearly wear many hats across various organizations that you organizations that you contribute to. Um, let's start by discussing your work with the ACA. Um, so, angel investing is an important slice of the broader pie for startup funding. Can you describe what exactly angel investing is and how people of all different backgrounds and generations can get involved? I know in your TED talk, which was amazing, by the way, I'm gonna just fangirl this entire time. Um, you, talk about, <laughs> you talk about the correlation kind of between Kickstarter, GoFundMe, Shark Tank. Um, these are things that people have watched or used or at least know about. So can you dive a little bit into that and kind of show us where we can get started? Sure. 
So angel investing, simply put, is when someone uses their own money to invest in a private company. So a lot of us are familiar with public companies, like you could go to E-Trade or something like that and buy a, a share of Apple stock, for example. Um, but private investments are trickier because there is no exchange or platform necessarily to invest in a private company. And, um, or at least until recently, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, of the things that you see on this particular slide, you may have heard about crowdfunding. So when we talk about crowdfunding, there's a couple different types. Kickstarter is rewards-based crowdfunding. Buy something prior to manufacturing and be able to um, get it before anybody else could. And that's kind of the... Um, that's kind of the reason why people would use Kickstarter. Uh, they're trying to raise money. They don't have the money yet to for the invoices. So, you know, they that's really a reason why they would use it. And you, as the consumer, you don't uh, have any equity in the company or you don't have any ownership there, but you at least get to preview the item early. With GoFundMe, you're the crowd is now rallying around a family or a cause in order to raise money as a donation-based uh, crowdfunding. So again, you don't have any ownership in the company or in the cause, but you're just, you're donating. <clears throat> the third one is called equity crowdfunding, which we don't have listed here, but that is actually a way that you can get ownership into a company um, for a little bit of money. And that's usually on a platform um, online where you can see all of the information about a particular company that is fundraising using equity crowdfunding. So it's a little bit like Kickstarter, except that instead of getting an actual product or something early, you would get a small piece of ownership into the company. And the big guys who are running the, have the market share of the equity crowdfunding right now is WeFunder, Start Engine, and Republic. So like, for example, if you went to republic.co, which is their uh, website, you would be able to see all kinds of different companies that are raising using equity crowdfunding. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission only allowed for equity crowdfunding as of 2016. So while that was eight years ago now, it's still very, very, very early days because you have to keep in mind the rules changed in 2016. Well, then everybody kind of had to get their act together about, well, what platforms are we going to use and what platforms are actually going to rise to the top and who's going to be able to get all the regulatory right and how, you know, how are we going to market this? And so that took years to get to a point where it's now e way easier, much easier than it was in the past. It's still not as prevalent, but um, the data that we have seen as far as the rise of people using equity crowdfunding has been significant. So um, it, compared to what has happened otherwise, and I won't get into all the, I won't bore you with all the details. Um, you can listen to my podcast though, Angel Next Door, and you can get all kinds of information about equity crowdfunding. I do personally believe it's a gateway for people to get involved in angel investing because you can do it for a very low dollar amount. If you have internet access and you have access to a bank account or a credit card, you could be an angel investor for like $100 or $200. It's, it's very accessible now. That was something that was just not even thought about uh, back when I started doing angel investing. So I'm pretty excited that people can um, participate pretty easily, and then that could lead to them being more comfortable and learning and then participating at a different level down the road. Now, the one thing um, that I will say related to equity crowdfunding is, you know, we need to make sure that um, that uh, the companies themselves that are fundraising, those are the ones that are actually, they're going to benefit because they're getting the marketing side and they're getting the fundraising side. So if it's a product, so I, I always caution uh, companies that if you have a product that is a consumer product, you could do very well with equity crowdfunding. If it's not so consumer based, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So, um, you know, just that's something that we can we could have a whole other webinar about, um, but it is really uh, interesting just to see how many companies are now fundraising using equity crowdfunding. And some of the statistics that the SEC put out last year were that 70% of companies using equity crowdfunding were not in a major city. That's really interesting data because 
that's basically telling us that people in all of these places in the middle of the country are using equity crowdfunding and uh, not necessarily doing that in such, you know, um, metropolitan areas. The other piece of data that was interesting was how many underrepresented founders are using equity crowdfunding. So definitely it's something to keep an eye on. And of course, most people are familiar with Shark Tank and that does give a frame of reference for uh, angel investing. But keep in mind, it does look like on the show, you have to be a billionaire and fly in a private plane. And that's just simply not the case anymore. So um, back in the day, you did have to have a lot, a lot of money in order to angel invest, but now it's really accessible to a lot of people. That's awesome. Thank you. And yeah, that was one of the things you and I had talked about when I first met you about um, cause that was kind of my understanding is you have to be a billionaire and that's the only way to do it. But I had no idea there were so many ways to do it. So that's, that's great to hear. Um, all right. Awesome. Let's move on. Um, so let's start off with what we really want to know women in business. Um, so I have some stats here. Um, it was determined that businesses funded by women, um, kind of what you said earlier, deliver higher revenue, almost more to two times more um, per dollar invested. Um, and this is according to a study of over 350 startups with mass challenge and BCG. Um, so in your opinion, why does it make smart financial sense um, to invest in women led companies? Well, as women, and of course, I'm generalizing here when I'm talking about this, <laughs> there's always exceptions to the rule and we I, I hate, you know, stereotyping. Um, <laughs> however, as women, we do tend to be scrappier. Um, we can stretch a dollar farther. It's so much harder to, for us to fundraise, as we've seen from the statistics, that the money that we do get, we are very careful what we do with it and make sure that we are using it to its absolute advantage. And not to say that our male counterparts are, you know, spendthrifts, but um, there's just a different mindset when you have to struggle as much as you do as an underrepresented founder to fundraise. And I think that comes through in the data related to how well the companies are performing once they do get that fundraising in. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, cool. And um, just so everyone knows, I will be sending out these slides um, and a recording of the webinar. So you'll be able to look at these figures more in depth. And um, these are from the 2022 recap. Um, so it'll have years from 2021, 2020, um, but there's actually newer information out there as well. So we'll send the link to that too. Um, awesome. Okay. So in these um, 2022 figures, we see that males still lead and follow on investments and verticals vary by gender. Um, but over the two years that this data is pulled, there are big changes on the female side year over year versus the male side. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about how you got your start in this predom predominantly run um, by male industry. And can you tell us more about your goals at Mindshift, Mindshift Capital for helping women led companies bridge the gap? Yeah, sure. So I remember uh, I, very early on, I went to an Angel Capital Association Summit. It's our annual meeting where we all gather as angel investors, and there was a line at the men's room. So and that tells you anything about how many women were actually involved in angel investing at the time. Um, it was pretty uh, dismal. However, over the years, it has changed dramatically. At the last uh, summit meeting I was at, which was in May of 2023, uh, the diversity at the conference was just so refreshing and very, I was so optimistic leaving that conference, just seeing how many women, people of color, I mean, so many people of diversity, diverse backgrounds of all kinds. And when I say diverse, I don't just mean gender and race. I'm talking about um, geography, uh, education, you know, everything about diversity really does impact decisions. So, um, you know, I was really excited to see that and how much it's it has gotten better at the very, very early stages as far as the angel world. And once you get higher up the food chain, as we call it, into like VC and private equity, 
um, I don't know that it has changed nearly as dramatically, and we still have a lot of work to do at the angel level. Um, as far as the goals of MindShift and what, what what I've been working on with some of my other colleagues just in the whole investing in women's space is we want to see more fund managers out there who can run a successful fund and actually fundraise at a higher level. So right now we're seeing a lot of women and under other underrepresented fund managers raising at very um, you know, very small amounts. And when I say that, I mean like $5 million or even $10 million is still considered a very small venture capital fund. It's more like an angel fund or a micro VC fund, as they call it. I would like to see um, underrepresented fund managers be able to raise at the hundred million and up to a billion dollars, which um, that would require institutional investors to invest we need to start getting these institutes to take a chance. I don't even know how else to say it on um, on underrepresented fund managers who maybe don't have the Sequoia level track records uh, out there that would be that would make that an institutional investor feel comfortable. So I think it's a lot about educating. It's about helping these earlier fund managers to get a track record, even if it is at a smaller dollar amount, but then really helping them to propel up into um, being able to raise a larger fund. So with these slides, you'll see that um, we were talking about how men still are dominating the follow on investment and, you know, I, I'm hoping that as we keep talking about it and educate, you know, talking and educating, we can get that number to change. I think in, in, in angel world, we are not as good at follow on investments as our BC and higher uh, upstream partners are. Um, they have more, uh, a, a more of a regimented um, structure. So they have a certain amount of money that they set aside for follow on funding when they're at the VC level and higher where angels, we tend to like the next shiny object. Um, sometimes, so, uh, we want to make sure that we're really being thoughtful about the follow on funding that, uh, we as angels are putting out. And I think the, if we start to get more women to be check writers and we're talking more about follow on funding and why it's so important that we're going to start to see those numbers change. The other slide is about the verticals. And the interesting thing here is, and I just pulled some of the more recent data because uh, we have our new angel funders report um, on the angel capital association that Victoria was talking about. We'll put a link in the chat. It's hot off the press. Um, but one of the things with the verticals that I found really interesting was that in 2021, women were really not showing as, um, as participating very much in SaaS companies. But in the 2022 data, it shows that women are up to 12% um, of their companies are in the SaaS area. So, you know, um, software as a service, which in a lot of cases, investors really like that type of an investment because it's not nearly as capital intensive. Things in the medical space, biotech, they are much more capital intensive and they take longer. So while we tend to be a big fan of that as investors um, and we wanna see those types of changes in the world, they're not gonna bring the returns as fast or sometimes as large. So um, I thought that piece of data was interesting. And the other thing about um, the SAS data, I also found very interesting is that for men, it actually decreased. So while women, it was increasing significantly, it was actually decreasing for um, for men. So, you know, hey, um, data always tells an interesting story. So I thought that was a, a cool piece. Perfect. Yeah, and to your point, um, the event that I had attended, it wasn't the summit, um, but the women investor one last year. It was really cool to not only see, like you said, such a diverse background of age and race and wealth and status and everything but it was also really cool to hear women talk about money i feel like you don't hear that a lot um and right. it's it's not a bad subject it's something that we can talk about um so that was one of the cool takeaways that i definitely had from that 
Um, all right, so let's move on to dive deeper into making decisions when it comes to investing. Um, so reliable market data and insights are critical for both startups and well-established companies. It is proven that private technology companies led by women are more capital efficient, achieving 35% higher ROI, according to Kauffman Foundation. At BCC Research, we have many different products that benefit startups, um, specifically our scorecards and innovation spotlights that give snapshots of the industries and highlight new innovations, IPs, patents, um, things like that. So when it comes to angel investing, what are the key market insights needed today and how can the market research industry improve how we cater our research offerings to this market? Well, data is definitely king um, and mm -hmm. we need more of it. We need more angel level data. Um, we have some, uh, the Angel Capital Association does a great job of collecting data from its members and putting a report together. Um, there's also information in the SEC's annual report, which we can also put a link to um, when we send out the um, after show information. But we need more data because when we go and talk to our legislators about what's happening and why we need help, you know, for tax relief or help to get um, more funding to entrepreneurs, help to make it easier for people to invest. Um, they're asking, well, how much, you know, how much is actually being invested in this asset class and, and how many losses have there been and what's the fraud rate and, you know, those types of things. And, you know, we want to be able to tell a really good story about all of the amazing innovations that are happening and the things that are going on in angel world all over the country, not just in the coasts. So I think the more market data that we can have, um, especially in the middle of the country, that would be really key. And um, but it's it's hard at the at the earliest of stages because sometimes the data isn't tracked. You know, a lot of angels, they write checks out of their own checkbook, so they're not, you know, having to answer to anybody. They're not having to keep records. I mean, they keep their own records, but they're not having to necessarily, um, you know, keep records to show that they have invest. You know, if, if a fund has investors, they have to keep all kinds of you know records and things like that. So so I just think the more market research that we can have on, you know, what's really happening in the middle of the country, what's happening with underrepresented founders, how can we get them more capital? All of that is gonna really help just to propel um, there being more equality amongst the fundraising out there. Absolutely. Um, and we know that not every company is looking for the same insights and forecasts. So at BCC, we pride ourselves on our custom consulting reports um, to ensure they're really tailored to our clients' exact needs. Um, so, if we move on, in this figure, um, we see that healthcare and IT dominated seed investments, which are two um, main audiences for BCC research. So, specifically, when it comes to ACA, what kind of data and market information do angel investors or professional fund investors need at their fingertips? So, basically, how can market research and data companies like us um, help your organizations and um, get the data that they need to make those proper decisions. I know the information, like you said, sometimes it's coming from checkbooks. You can't really get that. Um, but how can, I guess, we help? I think having more exit data um, okay. and, and learning more about the different aspects of the exits, you know, even sometimes though there could be a really good exit for angels, but the information about the actual amount of money that was exchanged, the returns that the angels got is all sealed. You know, that makes it difficult too, because then we're trying to say, wait a minute, okay, well, what can we learn from this? You know, we're always trying to, to learn and do better and, and make it so that it's easier for the next person who's going to invest. So I really think any type of exit data that we can get, you know, this is a great chart showing, you know, where we're investing, you know, the types of companies that we want to invest in. Well, we would make better decisions if we knew where the exits were coming from too. the types of companies that are buying those uh, earlier stage companies and the types of returns that angels are getting. Angels are getting returns. Um, we just don't have enough really good data to to tell the story. 
Absolutely. Awesome. So, um, doing good while doing well, this seems to be how you are for your true self and everything you take on. And ever since meeting you, I've definitely been taking this on as well. It's very inspiring. Um, so, as I already mentioned, your TED talk was great and we need more information. So, we understand you have a book coming out soon with the same theme. Um, do yes. good while doing well. When does it come out and why should we all go up and pick a copy? So, yeah, so, um, I did, I was a speaker at TEDx Charlotte in, uh, 2022. And as I was, you know, finishing my talk, people came up to me and as I saw it on, on YouTube, they said, Hey, okay, now what do we do? Like, uh, in 11 minutes, I could only explain so much. So, um, I really am much more of a spreadsheet girl than, um, I thought I was as a writer, but apparently, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I surrounded myself with some really smart people and, uh, I wrote a book called do good while doing well. It's coming out in, um, September of 2024. And it kind of goes through and gives everybody the behind the scenes look at what I wish I had when I was starting in 2012 I'll, I'll mention is we talked about it like briefly but you know having that thesis or or kind of plan as opposed to squirrel squirrel you know shiny object oh i like that i'm going to invest in that and, I, and then you don't have any money for follow-on funding um these are the types of things i'm talking about in the book and i actually have a worksheet that goes along with the book that can help somebody who's brand new kind of decide like, well, what, what is it I care about and how might I go about doing this? And it's really more of like a why to book than a how to book on why you would want to invest in the changes that you want to see in the world. Great. Love that. Um, awesome. I think we're at our final question. Um, so closing the gap between female and male CEOs for initial investments is a step in the right direction. We see that here in figure 32. Um, so, staying on the topic of doing good while doing well, I want to ask you 1 final question before we get to the Q and a. Um, so, what can investors of any gender do to try and align their investment portfolio with their core values and use the prudent facts and data we've talked about throughout this webinar to invest in women. So, I think we have to go back again to changing our narrative toward the results that people are getting um, and that women are really getting some tremendous results as are people of color, uh, as are any really underrepresented founder. So if we can keep collecting, that's another type of data that we really wanna see. We wanna see data specific by um, the types of companies, who's running the companies and the diversity on their teams. And you know, personally, I really love to see a diverse team of all things that I mentioned earlier, you know, not just gender race, but, you know, where are they located? What kind of backgrounds did they have? What types of education did they have? If you get a whole bunch of people from the same university, the same place, um, you know, who are all the same gender and race, it doesn't matter what it is, and they're all together, you're not really going to have a lot of diversity of thought. And that's what makes these companies grow. So, tremendously. And so I'd really love to see that. Uh, there's a group out of Cincinnati that when they pick, it's a fund, and when they pick a company to invest in, um, it's all done by an algorithm so that the biases are taken out. And they do a an analysis of the different team members who are running the startup because they're trying to make sure that that balance of diversity is actually there and that they don't have like four people um, on the team who all have the same personality traits, because that wouldn't be a very good balance then for uh, the company and to make the company grow. And I just love that. And I, I, I just ran into somebody um, a couple weeks ago who was telling me that they also use a, a biased free uh, algorithm in order to make their final investment decisions. And I just think if we could all get to that, because we all have biases, we know this, um, but if we could get to a point where um, we're just really looking at how well companies are doing, we're all going to, all investors and all founders of all kinds will be successful. Thank you. Um, so thank you again, Marsha, for this engaging conversation and a peek behind the curtain of the world of angel investing. 
Um, I saw this quote and I felt it was the perfect way to sum up everything we've been discussing. So Allison Kaplan from Forbes says, no more excuses, the math adds up. Invest in women-led diverse startups and you'll make big returns. So. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you again very much. And that's all the questions I have. Um, so let's see what the audience wants to hear. We're now open for Q&A. Please send your questions to either, again, entire chat or just me if you wanna ask them privately. Um, I'm gonna check the chat. Okay, perfect. So it looks like we have a couple. Okay, so what was the hardest thing to overcome in an industry like this and does it still impact you today? Um, I think they're asking about the whole being female in a male dominated world. Um, I, I think at first it was a little intimidating to be in a room where I was one of the only women and I really didn't know a lot about angel investing, but um, I'm always encouraging people to understand that in order to um, become an angel, you don't need to know everything about angel investing. In fact, the newer people who come to a meeting actually bring a very fresh perspective and sometimes an even better perspective than the people who have been doing it for a long time. Um, I mean, I remember plenty of times that there would be a Q and A at the end of uh, an, an entrepreneur pitching their company and somebody who was brand new would ask a question and I would think to myself, Oh, why didn't I think of that? You know, it's just, um, you know, they, they come in with such fresh eyes. So everybody adds value. And I think um, just, we need to keep talking about this and, you know, to Victoria's point earlier about talking about money, you know, as women, we, we just haven't been, tr um, you know, kind of trained or even cultured to do that. It, you know, it was always like, oh, men do that or or that's something that your husband does or you know whatever and but more and more i'm seeing books written i'm seeing podcasts out there and, and women are talking more about money and we need to it's not a taboo subject um i know sometimes people get uncomfortable they don't necessarily like saying how much money they have or or that they even have enough money to invest or things like that so it it gets it's kind of crazy. If you don't have enough money, people feel like, oh, you know, that's that's bad. But if you have money, then you're not really supposed to talk about it. Because if you do, then it looks like you're bragging. I don't know. There's like there's so many different connotations to to talking about money. But if we just keep talking about it and making it more of our you know regular routine, not just talking about it once in a while, I think that could really make a difference and it's going to help to make everybody more comfortable going into certain situations where we're talking about investing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so speaking of money, how much money is needed to become an angel investor? Is that something that's possible for the average person? So I guess along with that, um, I know you mentioned kind of 50, a hundred dollars, whatever you have. Um, so what would be a good way to get started for maybe that, that lower income, um, start? Yeah. So equity crowdfunding, like I said, is pretty much accessible to anybody. Um, you can go onto the platforms, you can take a look around. Um, I always suggest that people look for a while before they ever make an investment, even if you think, oh, I, okay, $100, but still $100, $100, you know, I'll just lose money. So I would say start looking around and, and just seeing what is out there. Read the documents, read. The best thing that you could do on an equity crowdfunding site is to read the, the Q&A, the chat at the very bottom. I mean, read through the documents, obviously, but there, the thing I like about equity crowdfunding is you're not allowed as the, as the founder or the um, CEO of the company who's fundraising, you're not allowed to have conversations off of the platform. So if somebody asks a question, it has to be in the platform, which is great because that means everybody gets the same information. And so 
if so, so if the CEO does get a question off the platform, they're not allowed to answer it off the platform. They have to put it on the platform and then answer it there so that you can learn a ton just by reading the Q&A. So that's equity crowdfunding, and that can be done for a very low dollar amount. Um, once uh, somebody becomes what we call an accredited investor, which simply means that you have a certain level of income or wealth in order to invest, then you can invest in um, a company either through an angel group if you meet a company and you want to invest directly. But personally, I love funds because funds give you instant diversification, which I really, mm -hmm. really believe in and want to make sure that people do get diversification early on, because if you don't, you could end up losing all your money on one company and then you'll hate angel investing and we don't want that. So in order to become what is considered accredited, you need to have at least $200,000 in income, 300,000 if you're including a partner or a million dollars in net worth minus your home. That's currently the um, definition. And right now the Angel Capital Association is working to get um, to get a uh, an education component level of sophistication added to that. So if somebody was not hitting those thresholds that I just mentioned, they mm -hmm. could take some classes, maybe an assessment, and then be able to become accredited. Um, the term is a little um, misleading because it makes it sound like you had to get a like a certification or have mm -hmm. some kind of a accreditation um, like you would a CPA or something like that, and that's not the case. But if somebody is an accredited investor, nowadays you can find invest places to invest even in funds for as little as five or $10,000, where back in the day, um, meaning like even when I started in 2012, which wasn't that long ago, if you wanted to invest in a fund, you probably had to have um, $250,000 or some crazy amount of money like that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then a question, can you please talk on the overall purpose you have achieved in your role in angel investing and advocating? Wait, the overall purpose, did you say? Yep. The overall purpose you have achieved in your role in angel investing and advocating. Right. So, I mean, I'm a huge believer that if you really want to do good in the world, this is one of the ways that you can do this. If you really want to do well, meaning that you all you care about is financial returns, then this might not be the right asset class for you because it is illiquid, meaning that once you make an investment into a startup company, you will not see that money back for quite a while. And sometimes you may not see a bag at all, which is why we diversify, because some companies will succeed and some won't because it is risky. Um, but illiquid means that you can't take it back. Like, so right now, if anybody wanted to go set up an E-Trade account, they could do that and they could invest in some public stocks. And if they wanted to sell those stocks, they could do that 10 minutes later and then they could take the money out of the account. Okay, that's mm -hmm. very liquid. Right. Well, with these um, types of investments, they're very illiquid and it might take years for, for you to see a return. So, but I believe that the purpose of what I'm trying to do by being an angel investor personally is to try to help create the change that I want to see in the world. So, you know, charities and nonprofits are doing such tremendously good work but they get like a fraction of the amount of money that they actually need in order to do the types of things that they wanna do. So for-profit companies really have to be the ones who can do a lot of these earlier um, innovations and, and really help to, to bring those changes to life. We can't put the burden all on the nonprofits. It's just not fair. So um, being able to do that I believe is something where you can have both. You can do good and you can do well. And keep in mind at the Angel Capital Association, we do say that you really only want to invest into this asset class, maybe 5% of your investable assets. So this isn't like you're going to take all your money and go invest in angel investing. No, mm -hmm. you would take a small percent and you would slowly, you know, over time, you'd be able to invest a little bit and then you know, hopefully you get some returns, then you can do it again and, you know, kind of ebbs and flows like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and Rachel, another thing to touch on that 
Um, she goes in depth really well about that in her TED talk about the purpose of um, kind of like she, what she was saying, nonprofit versus for profit um, and how that really impacts it. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out and that link will also be in this webinar um, recap. Perfect. Um, and then we have one final question. I know we're coming up on time. Um, so where are women investing their money and what are the top industries slash emerging markets? So right now I would say femtech as it's being called uh, women's health is probably one of the biggest and hottest things to invest in mainly because uh, I didn't really know this until I was educated by a lot of my femtech investing friends. Um, but you know, a lot of the research that's been done over the many, many years that the medical industry has been doing research, they do tend to do most of their research on males or, or the cells of men. And then they will just kind of think that women are kind of little men. So they will adjust maybe a little bit, sometimes not at all. Like if you, if you bought a bottle of Advil or, or Tylenol or, you know, any type of aspirin and you looked at the packaging, does it say a man should take this much and a woman should take this much? No, it doesn't. But, but like, I weigh like a fraction of, you know, mm -hmm. from uh, men. So, so then I'm thinking like some men, or like double my size, they should take the same dose I should. So that's just an example of like, we need to be more conscious of how we are going about medical research for women. And that is really starting to come into the forefront now. And I love that because now we're starting to see that, you know, some things actually work for men and some things work for women and, and some things don't, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have, you know, men and women have hormonal and everything you know, ch you know, uh, variations in them. So it would totally make sense that we wouldn't necessarily have the same reaction to medications or whatever it is. So I just think femtech is really probably one of the areas that you're going to see a lot of, um, of innovation happening in the next several years, decades, which is going to be great. Yeah. Um, I love that. We're definitely also seeing that at BCC, we came out with an article, sorry, not an article. A blog post on um, one of our reports about the women's health app market and everyone loved it and it was definitely one of our highest so that worked out really well um but to your point it's like men and women's bodies are so different so why don't why aren't those just normal things um to have on a medicine bottle or to have at the doctor or whatever it is um, exactly yeah Perfect. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, so thank you, Marsha, for answering all those questions um, and giving such great insight to the investing world. Um, just a reminder to all attendees with a corporate email address, um, you'll receive a free consultation from BCC Research on leveraging data and insights to become a leader in your industry. Um, so we'll be reaching out tomorrow to schedule this and also send out the webinar recording and slides. Um, and then on Marsha's website, which is linked right there, there's a complimentary P PDF, um, why women don't get enough funding and all um, attendees can download that as well. Um, once again, I'm Victoria Franco. This is Marsha DeWood. We wanna thank everyone for taking the time to join us together. Um, this was incredible. So thank you to the audience. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, BCC Research um, and have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Bye, everyone.